actually yeah let's talk about this fuck it so eugene rabkin um i made a video about him previously he's the i'm he's the head honcho at styles at style zeitgeist a very popular kind of avant-garde uh fashion platform and forum um during the time when super future and fifth dimension forum and a few other places were kind of dying um so the style site guys was still the place that a lot of people that are kind of fans of andy lemuster rick owens and that whole um kind of like goth ninja look was still posting fit still posting pickups still posting like sale notices and shit it was kind of a thriving community so it's sort of it sort of survived the um the advent of instagram and all those places because a lot of the people that were on forums are now just posting their fists directly onto instagram or they have like kind of places they kind of uh, pages they sort of follow on there so for the most part it's sort of like made forums redundant and also the kind of uprising of uh, facebook groups and like pages is also kind of um, relegated um forums to the kind of never regions of the internet but for the most part stars like has been able to reinvent itself they've now got a magazine they've got a pretty popular uh, website where they kind of post op-eds and opinion pieces and one of the most four and one of those opinion people opinion people on their platform is the head honcho eugene rabkin who i've kind of always had a little bit of a love relationship with i kind of appreciate his passion i appreciate his dedication i appreciate how highly invested he is in fashion overall i appreciate his kind of honest takes on collections especially um when he's in paris and there's you know and there's this kind of um hype train going along for a certain designer he's always somebody that you can kind of rely on to kind of give you the actual realness of what's actually happening um i appreciate that whole malarkey but there is something about his disdain towards what fashion has become nowadays and you know it's no it's no coincidence that he starts to hate fashion just when the fashion voice the voices in fashion are changing away from the kind of conventional went to a fashion school look like a certain way speak a certain way like it's moving away from that and it's kind of um you know as uh, as i've mentioned a few times it's sort of like within this uh street where uh bubble or suddenly the street where cloud at the moment everything's kind of been influenced by brands are taking inspiration directly from the quote-unquote streets which everyone should be doing anyway because if you take cooperation from things that are around you but it seems as if like his disdain for that kind of current trend and the people that are now being championed behind it has i don't know i wouldn't show i'm not sure if you'd call it racial overtones i'm not sure if i would go that far to say that but there is something about his kind of criticism about it that kind of rankles me that kind of runs me out the wrong way and he recently put an op-ed out um that i don't necessarily agree with in any way part or form but i kind of wanted to share it and just kind of get it out there and see what else other people think about it so um this op-ed he put out recently on styles like guys is called how premium mediocre fashion conquered the world so um uh, you know effectively we know exactly where he's kind of going with it but let's kind of read a few bits and pieces of it and i'm going to kind of break it down from my end and say the pieces that i think i don't necessarily agree with so um can i zoom in here or not I don't think I can. Okay, anyway. So um, let's continue the article. So um, it's on Styles Like Us. I'll link it in, in the show notes so you can check it out if you're listening via audio or watching it on video. You can read along. So last year, the, the article starts. Last year, the the blogger, uh, Vin, Vinkatesh Rao, coined the term premium mediocre. He was referring to a segment of economic activity largely dreamed up by marketeers to give the masses the illusion that they are consuming luxury, when in reality where they were doing nothing of the sort some examples of what was proven to be a highly profitable sector craft beer artisanal pizza 25 dollars signature burgers and my personal favorite premium economy on domestic flights the idea is simple by dressing up something mediocre is premium with extra touches and real uh, the real and imagined companies play on the comp on the people's aspirational drive to give them the illusion that they are purchasing into something elevated the marketing speak created around the premium mediocre sector terms such as uh, terms like preferred signature and collection the best use uh, piled on top of each other to make say signature collection here the paradox of providing an air of exclusivity without excluding anyone is key and again i, I take umbrage to this point especially the, the point about the um premium economy flights i don't think anyone that's um going on a premium economy flight is under any illusion that they're kind of getting some sort of uh, luxury treatment from fucking ryanair if anything it was more so um an incentive it was more so an incentive to ryanair to just make more money and to also make sure that there's not as not not as many long queues as, as there need to be unnecessary long queues if you go on any ryanair flight for the most part the queues are insanely long 
They don't, and they don't need to be. And there's only a certain amount of baggage space because usually most people that are going on Ryanair flights aren't checking in their baggage, right? They're going to take on carry-on luggage. So that's going to mean the baggage allowance that is available overhead is going to be all taken up. So it makes sense for the airline companies or budget airlines to make more money and to ease the queue congestions to allow people that want to be on, on a quote-unquote economy flights to buy reserve seating. That's going to cost a little bit extra. And you go into a different queue to buy... Um, um, the capabilities to bring on um, hand luggage and to put it into the overhead lockers but I don't necessarily think that's uh, somehow everyone, anyone in that queue I don't think anyone with any sort of sense is in that, that's in that queue is thinking that they're in first class or Ryanair that's insane first class uh, luxury, a luxury in, in especially in flying you see it when you go on first class like there is a clear difference in the treatment in the things that you're able to use like being able to carry your bag onto the plane earlier than everyone else or being able to sit before everyone else on a plane that's going to leave at the same time it's just it's, it's insane so that kind of that correlation is a bit it's a bit of a stretch a correlation to do with pizza is a bit of a stretch a correlation to do with burgers is a bit of a stretch but again let's go and continue and hear what else he has to say um this is an old story in fashion, and it wouldn't be a surprise if Starbucks and Delta executives have taken a page out of the fashion's playbook. What's relatively new is how pervasive premium mediocre fashion has become. Take a look around, and it won't be hard for you to spot premium mediocre fashion virtually anywhere. From Unico cashmere that it doesn't feel like cashmere at all, to Balenciaga baseball hats and Gucci headbands. From logo Burberry keychains to pretty much anything on uh, the fragrance kind of Boomlandales. This is a weird argument. So he's complaining, he's complaining that big luxury fashion brands are wanting in an effort to kind of boost in a kind of in an effort to boost their sales because that's what they care about right bottom line they're not trying to create a mediocre class it's not the fact that these streetwear guys who happen to be black that are coming in and cheapening up your fucking brands it's that these luxury fashion brands are looking at their bottom line and seeing that the older clientele that was sustaining or that were kind of helping their brand stay afloat are now dying or are moving on to other things so they want to capture a young youth market and in order to capture that young youth market who don't have that much disposable income you have to allow them to to buy into their buy into your brand with uh i don't know kind of a headband with a wallet with a keychain that's where you're gonna let have some sort of brand loyalty from a kid that's like 16 you're gonna allow him to save up some money buy a keychain for 120 pounds and in the hope that when they turn 26 they're gonna come back to you for a trunk they're gonna come back to you at 45 for a pair of loafers that's what they're doing it for it's just for the bottom line it's not some sort of like um sinister um, initiative from the higher ups or from the quote unquote black people within streetwear now or they are sort of taking over fashion community in order to kind of cheapen the brands that you know and love it's fucking ridiculous um, anyway it continues um, the major purveyors of premium mediocre fashion uh, tend to be American uh, Michael Kors, Kate Spade, Tory Burch are superstars here they have built highly successful business by peddling goods in the medium in the mid hundred dollar range to the masses by marketing them in oxymoron affordable luxury of course what they're selling is not luxury but luxury does a sprinkle on top of a mediocrity but the point of that is many people don't, what are you talking about like do you honestly think a girl that buys a Michael Kors bag is in un, is in any any un, is any un, any un, uh, illusion that that thing is a Celine bag? She doesn't. She knows it's not a Celine bag. She just wants to look fucking nice and have a bag that doesn't look like it came out of Primark. Has a little bit of panache to it. Has a little bit of luxury to it. What's wrong with that? I don't see anything wrong with that at all. That that is completely fine. And it's Michael Kors. Michael Kors, Kate Spade, and Tory Burch aren't pretending to be Gucci. They're not pretending to be. It's a different kind of luxury. The times have moved on. The, the consumer is a little bit more discerning, but they also want access to these brands. They also want to be able to have entry-level items, and these are entry-level brands. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure people that buy into Michael Kors will eventually then progress up to Valentino or wherever the other brands are, but they need some sort of entry system into fashion. This, what's this um, idea about keeping it walled and keeping it gate? This is, this is like, this is, this sounds like somebody who's bemoaning the demise of gatekeepers, who's kind of um, reluctantly, tr reluctantly trying to hold on to his power. No, reluctantly, desperately trying to hold on to his power. Like it's ridiculous. It's gone. It's gone. Unfortunately, it's gone. Anyway, that's what continues. Just that I said, getting wrangled myself up for no reason. Premier Luka extends to higher um, echelons of fashion as well. Largely entry-level uh, product range, which is fine, which is how it should be. It's entry-level product range, Eugene. Premium Mediocre is the Prada nylon backpack, the Louis Vuitton bag with co with a coated canvas, the $375 Celine card holder. This segment of luxury fashion has been doing extremely well because the margins in Premium Mediocre segment are economically high. No, it's not. It's because loads of people are buying it because they want to buy into the brand. Yes, the margins are good for the business, but why it's been doing well is because people want to buy into 
Celine, but they might not have Celine money. They might not have enough money at the moment to buy ready to wear pieces at that present time. So what they do buy is they buy the card holder, is they buy a t-shirt, they buy a tote bag, they buy a scarf. That's fine. That's okay because eventually what you're hoping is that this discerning customer who's who's kind of traversed, who's kind of walked past all the fast fast all the fast fast the fast fashion stores, is kind of left left behind Zara, left behind H&M, excluded them and saved up all their money to buy a fucking Celine scarf that isn't cheap, right? It's gonna like five hundred dollars plus. You're hoping that in general they're gonna appreciate that scarf and see, wow, this scarf has lasted me four years, five years, and it survived many washes. I'm then gonna then invest into a pair of trousers, into into a blouse, into I don't know a necklace, whatever it may be. That's what you're hoping is. That's what the hope is when you make an entry when you make an entry level an item in your collection. Jesus. Um, as far as as far as 2015, according to um, Euro Monitor International, luxury small level goods accounted for 5.7 billion in sales, projected to grow to 7.5 billion in 2020. On List.com, the fashion shopping aggregator plastic sandals by Givenchy and, and Gucci routinely topped the most sought after product category. But that makes complete sense, though, right? If you are trying to buy into Gucci and you want an entry level item, a best way to do it is to go buy some slides. What is the what is the annoyance here? Pre mediocre fashion is not a new phenomenon. During the eighties, Parisian could could cheer lights as their name to mass market manufacturers. Blah 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 blah. Anyway. It continues on at the bottom here. The logo is key because in the age of Instagram, where people curate their lives in two dimensions on a small screen, the logo is more important than um, the product itself. And the best part about consuming premium mediocre today is that no one will scoff because no longer in good taste for the rich to turn their noses up at the rest of us. Democratization of fashion is trendy and provides us all with a, with a therapeutic illusion that we are somehow more equal. What the fuck are you talking about? You absolute donor. Um, of course, it's not only an illusion. All you need to do is score on medicine. Look, okay, I'm, I'm going to stop reading it because he's going to contaminate me with whatever um, hater juice he's got going running through his system at the moment. Eugene's a hater. That's basically it, man. Eugene's a hater. He, he's, he's one of the fashion... Um, he was one of the fashion gatekeepers and now he's seeing that his influence has is kind of dwindling. He's seeing the conversation within the fashion community is shifting away from his kind of artisanal uh, go to fashion school, study under um, a very storied house and then kind of reach and then kind of branch out and do your own thing. He's seen that kind of narrative is sort of kind of dying down a little bit. People are coming from various different backgrounds into the fashion industry and are taking over big houses or are, do, are, are getting really big jobs at the moment or are getting massive Cosigns, and it's really, really pissing him off. Um, he's a little bit of a cynic. Um, I guess he's a little bit, um, what's that word called? Embittered about where the direction of the fashion is happening, where it's going at the moment. And I, and I understand it. I understand it. Being a lover of fashion, I get where it is. But I, I would implore anyone that has that kind of thinking just to kind of look at it on the bright side and see that the democratization of fashion is amazing because it's allowing all of us that are interested in fashion to buy into it to be able to attend a show the democratization of fashion means that big fashion brands are live streaming their fashion their, their fashion shows um their runway shows in paris especially the most of the the the, the place that i kind of keep my eye on for the most part when i was back in canning town reading uh sunday time style magazines in the comfort of my home desperately trying to uh, envision myself uh, taking part of in fashion being involved in that community before i knew about all the nonsense that goes on in it but when i was dreaming about getting involved i would have loved to be able to have a live stream of a saint laurent show i'd have loved to be able to see a live stream of a, of a dior home show where Hallie cement was there but it wasn't it wasn't something that was happening at the time because fashion had not been democratized at that moment it wasn't where it is now where it's part of the general conversation so democratization of fashion is allowing kids nowadays to be able to have access and see runway shows in their full glory for the comfort of their own home which is then inspiring them to create their own little fashion moments or their own little fashion collectives or their only fashion communities within the industry that within the place that they live in now it's an amazing time to be a fashion infuser it's an amazing amazing time we have access to some of the biggest and best brands we have some of the best talent that are now kind of getting involved in fashion because there's so much money involved in it now that kids actually see themselves see a career um long lasting within the industry which wasn't something that would be said a few years back the the, the people that were getting paid the most were the ones that you saw in front of the uh in front of the camera screen but now the people behind the scenes are getting paid if not as much if not more than the people that are involved in that that are in the front such as the influence what it may be look what's done to the influence has allowed a whole generation of people who have been blessed with good looks blessed with good style to make money from just wearing cool outfits that's fucking amazing that's so cool research and research and development uh departments for brands are now able to kind of put out pieces and give them to or see them out to influence in order to kind of gauge what piece is going to sell what piece is not going to do well they're able to do um interesting launching so the pop-ups in terms of launching stuff online like some cool stuff is happening right now with fashion that 
is far away from the kind of cynical end if you look at from the Eugene Rabicon side of like oh look at all this stuff logo driven all this stuff whatever who this is amazing all brands that are all the brands that he mentioned the Gucci's the Louis Vuitton's the Celine's whatever they may be yes they have uh, some logo heavy pieces that are uh, permanently aimed at people who want to wear things on Instagram and have it photographed and stuff so it photographs well that's fine but for all the logo heavy stuff there's still many many pieces in fashion collections that you can get that have no excessive branding on it that you could just wear that that are good pieces in general and just because it has brand doesn't mean it's bad if it has branding on it, you don't like it. Just don't buy the branded piece. I'm a big fan of Supreme. I have been since the in, since I've kind of discovered Supreme in I don't know in 2003, whenever it was when I first um, happened to stumble upon a brand. Nowadays, uh, you never see me dead in the box logo. I'm not gonna wear a, a jumper with, with uh, Supreme inscribed on the front of it or whatever. But there's still many pieces within the, within the collection that I can be a fan of and buy. But I'm not going to begrudge them for uh, catering to that market that wants to have a jacket that says Supreme on it's 57,000 times. That's fine. It doesn't cheapen the brand to me. It just means that they're able to talk to different people. They're able to talk to a skater. They're able to talk to a fashionista. They're able to talk to me. That's, that's in the middle. It's the best time ever that we're, that's, that's ever existed, in my opinion. For somebody that's been locked up in the bedroom, reading through magazines, it's my only access to um, accessing the fashion community. And I have websites like Now Fashion that, that takes pictures of uh, people at the collection, people at at the runway shows um in and around the scene and stuff you have bloggers taking pictures you have the gq stuff you have the stuff on style.com and the street style stuff you have the various um instagram profiles that sharing content you have brands um live streaming their stuff online live in the streaming and stuff on ig it's fucking amazing demarkization of fashion is the best thing that's ever ever happened and um i'd implore anyone not to be as cynical as eugene i know he's been kind of he's probably been a bit bashed and bished and smushed by the industry in general so he's become a little bit bitter but in general, I don't agree with anything he says in this article. I think he's making some stretches or some comparisons that make absolutely no sense. You know, it's just, it's a bizarre article. But I employ you to read it and make your own mind up. And um, But then, I, like I said, I think we are living in the best of times if you're a fashion enthusiast. And I only think you have to look around at the, at the brands that are heralded as some of the top ones around. Look at what they look at what they're selling. Look at the items that people are buying. Look at the people that are getting involved. Look at look at the amount of jobs that have been uh, made. Look at the people that have been put on. It's amazing. Amazing, amazing industry, man. And I fucking love it. And I won't have anything bad said about it. Anyway, 